All right, this is a lecture on evolutionary ecology. It's the last in the series of um, lectures on this subject for this course. I hope you guys all had a good vacation. I hope we're ready to start this, even though we are all sort of um, on edge with respect to the epidemiology <clears throat> and the global pandemic, but we'll get through it. So let's give it a try. This lecture is going to be a review of speciation processes, um, discussion of geographic variation, adaptive radiation, convergent evolution, and the optimal allocation of resources. So first of all, the biological species concept is <clears throat> burst upon the scene in uh, the 1940s by Ernst Meyer. Groups of actually or potentially interbreeding populations, which are reproductively isolated from other such groups. This was sort of the culmination of the work of the modern synthesis of the day. So we have a population where the members, be, some members become isolated. If it's a small group, they experience the founder effect, maybe genetic drift, different kinds of mutations. The two populations evolve independently. When they're reintroduced, if they cannot produce viable offspring, we say that speciation has occurred. During that time, since they have evolved independently, we may see different kinds of behavior, different kinds of physiology, different kinds of morphology that prevent interbreeding. And so this leads to this idea of speciation or the acquisition of reproductive isolation with subsequent potential hybridization. So after Myers um, introduced the idea of the biological species concept, a bunch of uh, evolutionary biologists said, well, what about speciation that's non-geographic? And the idea of sympatric speciation raises its head. <clears throat> and essentially, reproductive isolation between two populations occurs without geographic isolation. And a good example of this is polyploidy, where chromosomal number changes from one generation to the next. The idea of parapatric species, where we have a serial chain, essentially, of different populations. <clears throat> and we have sympatric species um, in the true sense, where we see uh, differentiation by insects onto different host plants or differentiation, differentiation of plants due to intense herbivory on them. And there are other aspects of this as well. So the idea in some respects with sympatric speciation or there seem to be more biological driving functions to this rather than simply geographic isolation. So part of the question has always been, can biological speciation be driven <clears throat> simply by the interactions between organisms without allopatric speciation? And the more we look at this, the more we're beginning to realize that the answer is yes, but allopatric speciation is still maybe the dominant model. Then we have this concept of ecotypy, where we find locally differentiated populations of the same species are essentially different due to intense habitat selection. Um, this is very, very common on the tailing piles of mines in Britain, where there'd be a tin mine or a lead mine, and the slag that came out of that mine had flowers growing on it, but they were different from the flowers growing in the field. They would flower at different times or they would look different. <clears throat> this is then extended to the idea of roadside weeds, um, when we used to have lead and gasoline. Uh, I myself have used it in the idea of corals, where we see adaptation of members of the same species to different depths, they end up with different growth forms. And the idea is that we have local, local adapted populations to some local event through habitat selection, but there's enough gene flow maintained between populations to keep them a single species. So you can think of it as many adaptive peaks within a single species. It's a little different than just the concept of biological species concept. <clears throat> and then there are sort of species that break the rules. We see hybridization. So good species interbreed to form intermediates. The incipient species, the idea that we have two different species that are either pulling apart or coming together, forming a hybrid zone. 
Sometimes we see introgressive hybridization where traits from one population will sort of pass through the hybrid zone and arise in individuals <clears throat> away from the hybrid zone in the other species. We see circular species overlap like the, the seagull populations around um, the, the northern hemisphere. And we often see hybridization in disturbed habitats. And I guess that's the idea that the niche dimensions were maintained and, and the different niches were maintained in the old growth forest. <clears throat> but when the habitat is disturbed, that breaks down. So there are many seeming exceptions to the biological species concept that we see in nature and expected. <clears throat> now, one of the other things we see is that we have peculiarities with respect to sympatric species. We see character displacement in which if you think of like, if you have a brother or a sister, you're not exactly like your brother or sister. Sometimes you're almost exact opposite opposites. And so when a small population begins to live in an isolated place, as that population increases, we tend to see specialization or um, into relatively narrow niches as opposed to broad niched creatures developing in these um, isolated habitats. Really good examples of this are Darwin's finches or Hawaiian honey creepers or Drosophila in, Hawaii, in the, um, the valleys of Hawaii or cichlids in the African rift lakes. And in many respects, this is what we call character displacement. And it's the diversion of incipient species into different niches. And when this process becomes more elaborate, we term it adaptive radiation. So for example, with Darwin's finches, there was some ancestral seed eating ground finch. <clears throat> some of these, and um, some of the descendants of this ancestral population die specialized on eating insects. Some specialized on eating various parts of plants and some specialized on eating fruits. And this is evident in their different bills and the structure of their bills and the sizes of their bills. So it, it kind of is um, a very interesting situation that normally develops in very isolated habitats such as islands and um, isolated lakes like in Lake Malawi and other parts of the uh, African Rift Lakes. <clears throat> now on a larger time zone we see what we think of as adaptive zones where um, we will see the invention of a critical new characteristic that permits the possessor to occupy this new adaptive zone. And a good example of this are owls and, um, and hawks. Owls tend to feed at night on the same animals that hawks feed on in the day. But the ability of the hawk to um, to fly in the daytime and see very well, as opposed to the ability of the owl to fly at night and be very quiet and echolocate very well with its ears, meant that the owl um, sort of merged into a new adaptive zone or evolved into a new adaptive zone. The same thing could be said for flight. When we see um, reptiles begin to develop the concept of flight and we see the evolution of birds, or the evolution of um, bony fish, the osteoichthys, from um, the agnathids or the uh, cartilaginous fish. So these are sort of like large scale adaptations that move into a different realm within which it's possible to have many different forms. And then we see an adaptive radiation explode from that. <clears throat> I think in all of this, we have to realize that the biological species concept and any models that we want to build based on that um, really have to take into consideration that we have all kinds of intermediate stages. And there may be other ways in which populations have evolved over time, such as ecotypy or the idea of reticulate speciation, where over long, deep time, species merge and then diverge and merge and diverge. So all of this is going on at the same time, and we can't really apply just a single concept.
It has a set of strict rules within this domain. It can't be stretched beyond that to describe everything. In some respects, if you go out and you look in the real world, you see a continuum of phenotypes. You see changes in animals of similar or within the same group, but of some different species, but similar groups like bears or mammals or birds <clears throat> you see, or fish, you see this change in, in phenotypes. And you see it sort of over large areas and changes in the geography. So we as scientists want to see these pure forms and think of the hybrids as some other product. But maybe we just had to pay attention to this continuum of phenotypes, which we think of as geographic isolate, geographic variation. This is variation along gradients that are geographic, like temperature, altitude, moisture. <clears throat> and the variation that we see by populations over their geographic ranges reflects the changes in selection pressures that are encountered by different environments. So, for example, going up a mountain, it's going to get colder, it's going to get drier, the ultraviolet radiation is going to change, the solar radiation in general will change. And what you'll see is <clears throat> these organisms changing, and it shows us how much they can change. In other words, what's their adaptive potential? It shows a relationship between biology and the environment, and we can use it to interpret the fossil record. So it's an interest in itself, and it also tells us quite a bit about biology. So there are a number of rules that have been developed by different people, and the rules are named after the people that developed them. <coughs> like Bergman, who said body size increases with latitude. So bears in the northern, at the North Pole are bigger than bears in the tropics. <coughs> Mammals in general get larger as you move north or south from the equator. And that reflects a shift in surface to volume ratios. Small animals lose heat because they have much greater surface relative to their volume. Larger animals have a harder time radiating heat because they have much more volume compared to their surface. So a polar bear would stay warm in Alaska, <clears throat> but it would probably get heat stroke if it lived in Brazil. Um, same thing for Allen's rule. The extremities, the legs, are shorter in the cooler parts of an animal's range. And you might say, well, what about wolves? Or what about coyotes? Yes, they have relatively long legs, <clears throat> and they have the mammalian diving reflex where their pads are almost the temperature of the environment. They're just above freezing, and there's a restriction um, somewhere in there, what would we would think of as their wrist, which would stop the flow of heat from the rest of their body through their pads. So there are some adaptations that get around some of these things. Um, Gloger's rule is that mammals are darker in warm climates with wet soils, lighter in cooler climates that are drier. Um, <clears throat> this probably has to do with adaptive coloration. Jordan's rule, which is interesting. David Starr Jordan was a very well-known ichthyologist. Um, fish in warm water have fewer vertebrae than those in cool water. And then David Lack's work on birds that shows birds have smaller clutch sizes in the warmer parts of their range. And this is mostly migratory birds, the, neo -mig the neotropical migrants that move from tropical South America up into North America or, or into the Patagonia region of South America. They tend to be seed eaters in the tropics, and they tend to be protein eaters when they migrate. And so when they migrate, for example, into the north woods of North America, they eat insects. So part of this is a nutritional aspect. Now, <clears throat> so far we've been talking about divergent evolution, populations diverging into different forms. But what about convergent evolution? In different parts of the world, there are similar selection pressures that um, result in the evolution of different kinds of animals that have the same, that look the same. 
For example, the rhea, the ostrich, the emu, and the moa are all large flightless birds. Cactus and euphorbs. Um, cactus are in the new world, euphorbs, um, euphorbiaceae are in the old world. Hummingbirds and hawk moths serve a similar function of pollinating. They look the same from a distance, but in reality, one's an insect and one's a bird. So we'll see this kind of convergent evolution. We also see convergent on a, convergence on a common phenotype in animals that are close to each other. <clears throat> For example, Batesian mimicry, where there's a distasteful model and a palatable mimic. In other words, it's good to eat. The best known example of that is probably the monarch and the viceroy butterfly, <clears throat> where the monarch feeds on milkweeds and assimilates these distasteful cardiac glycosides into its body. And um, the viceroy doesn't feed on milkweed and I guess is pretty delicious. But if a naive blue jay takes one bite out of a monarch butterfly, it will never eat another butterfly that looks anything like a monarch. So in this case, you have this distasteful model, a palatable mimic, but the model always has to be more abundant than the mimic. So each generation, when the predator goes out and tests these different um, butterflies, it always has to have a higher probability of encountering a bad tasting model rather than a palatable mimic. Um, in malarian mimicry, we have many distasteful models. And if there's a bunch of different butterflies, for example, that look different, selection, and they all taste bad, selection would favor the convergence on a common phenotype. And we see both of these in nature, and we often see mixtures where we'll see multiple species um, sort of living in different living in different geographic parts say of south america from from the lowlands up into the mountains and we'll see what we think of as mimetic complexes where there's some batesian mimics there's some malarian mimics and they're all mixed together so you might find eight or ten species of butterfly that all begin to converge on a common form and um, this is a really interesting um, sort of way in which evolution works to protect and deal with the idea of predation. The other thing is that all of these various adaptations, geographic adaptations such as Bergman's rule, all adaptations that we think of reflect adaptations for successful reproduction. And they're all based on the organism being able to allocate its resources um, and especially in geographic isolation, in geographic variation across these clients. Now, if you consider the energies that organisms use and how they allocate them, for example, the sardine, where it uses about 91% of its respiration, of its energy to intake for respiration, about 2% for depositing fat, about 5 to 6% for growth, it's left with 2% for reproduction. And this is the, the most important thing it does in its entire life history. But it has to survive and then mate and then produce. So organisms have to allocate their resources such that they end up with a successful reproductive outcome. And again, it all goes back to this very simple idea of survival of the fittest where more organisms are produced and can be supported by the environment. Variations exist, and those variations are expensive to maintain. But without them, there can be no selection or differential survivorship. And we sort of count the overall fitness of an organism by its ability to survive, whether it's some sort of fantastic adaptation or just dumb luck find a mate and mate successfully and produce viable offspring. And that's the bottom line. Those organisms that produce viable offspring are the ones that are more likely to become ancestors than not. So I hope this little brief final um, lecture has uh, sort of helped you get a little more insight into evolutionary ecology. Thanks.